It's Steve here from Steve's Internet Guide and in this video we're going to look at uh, Secure Sockets Layer um, SSL certificates and certificate authorities and we're going to explain uh, how they're all related together and what uh, Secure Sockets Layer does and how you implement it. Secure Sockets Layer SSL and Transport Layer Security TLS are protocols that provide secure communications over a computer network or link. They're commonly used in web browsing and email uh, they'll also be used in the Internet of Things, which is why I'm covering it here. Uh, in this tutorial, we look at uh, TLS and SSL, symmetrical and asymmetrical keys, public and private keys, uh, algorithms, uh, why we need certificates and what they do, and how to get a, a digital certificate and how to understand the difference between the, the certificate types. So. TLS is based on SSL and was developed as a replacement in response to a vulnerability in SSL. The term SSL is commonly used today and it usually refers to TLS. So uh, TLS is the, the protocol or the standard used today and it's replaced SSL. But as I say, we normally refer to it as just SSL. So SSL or TLS provides data encryption, data integrity and authentication. This means that when you use um, Secure Sockets Layer, you can be confident that no one has read your message, no one has changed your message, and you're actually communicating with the intended person. That's actually very important. Now, when sending a message between two parties, you have uh, two main problems that you need to address. One is, how do you know no one's read the message? And the other is, how do you know one know that no one has actually changed the message? Now, these solution, the solutions to these problems are to encrypt it. This makes the content unreadable, so anyone viewing the message sees, sees it as just uh, gibberish. And the other thing is to sign it, and this allows the recipient to be confident that it was you who sent the message and the message hasn't been changed. Both encryption and digital signatures require the use of keys, and the key is simply a number. Now, 128-bit is a common uh, key size that's used. Now the key is combined with a message using a particular method and that's known as a, an algorithm and RSA is a, a common algorithm that, that's used. Now you can think of the message and the key as the ingredients if you're, cook, if you're into cooking and the algorithm as, as the recipe. Now there are two types of keys in use. One is a symmetrical key and the other is a, a asymmetrical keys. Now asymmetrical keys are commonly known as public and private keys. With a symmetrical key a key is used to encrypt or sign the message and the same key is used to decrypt the message. Now this is the same as the keys in your door or your car keys uh, that we deal in everyday life. You, the same key that locks the door is, the, sorry, the key that locks the door is the same key that opens the door. And the problem with this type of key arrangement is if you lose the key, anyone who finds it can unlock the door. Now with an asymmetrical key, two keys are used and these keys are mathematically related, but they're not the same. And they belong to what's known as a key pair. Now, asymmetrical keys, as I said, are commonly known as public and private keys. A message encrypted with an asymmetrical key or with a public key cannot be decrypt decrypted with the same public key. To decrypt the message, you require the private key. Now, if you use this type of arrangement with your car, then you can actually lock your car, leave the key in the car, because that key could not be used to unlock the car. This type of key arrangement is very secure and it's actually used in all modern encryption and signature systems. It's actually used in conjunction with symmetrical keys, which we'll see in a while. Uh, keys and certificates. Now, SSL or TLS use public and private key uh, systems for data encryption and data integrity. Now, public keys can be made available to anyone, hence the term public. Now, because of this, there's a question of trust. Specifically, how do you know that the particular public key belongs to the person or entity that it claims? Now, there's no point in sending an encrypted message to someone if that someone is not the actual person you, you want to send it to. Example, you receive a key claim that you belong to your bank. How do you actually know that it belongs to your bank? Well, the answer to that is to use a digital certificate. Now, a certificate serves the same purpose as a passport does in everyday life. A passport establishes a link between a photo of a person 
and that link has been verified by a trusted authority, in this case the, the passport office. Now, a digital certificate provides a link between a public key and an entity, uh, entity being a business, a domain name, that has been verified, and to verify it, it's signed by a trusted third party, and that trusted third party is known as a certificate authority, and it, saves, it serves the same purpose as your passport authority. A digital certificate provides a convenient way of distributed trusted public encryption keys. That's very important. As a, a digital certificate provides a convenient way of distributing trusted public encryption keys. Now, obtaining a digital certificate, to get a certificate from a recognized certificate authority um, is the same process as getting a passport from, from a passport office. As I say, the procedure is very similar. You fill out the appropriate forms, uh, you add your public keys, they're just numbers, and then you send it to the certificate authority. Uh, the certificate authority does some checks, depends on the authority, and then sends back the keys enclosed in a certificate as signed by the certificate authority. Now, you do the same thing with the passport. You, uh, you take a photo, have the photo verified by someone, and then you send the photo in the form off to the passport office, and the passport office sends you back your passport. The certificate is signed by the issue issuing certificate authority, and this is what guarantees the key. Now, when someone wants your public key, you send them the certificate, they verify the sig signature on the certificate, and if it verifies, then they can trust your keys. If it doesn't verify, then they can't trust your keys, and so they, they, don't, they don't use them. Now, we're going to look at an example usage that's common in everyday life, and this is a, the communication between a web browser and a web server that uses Secure Sockets layer. You can see that on the web browser it's using HTTPS, and you should see the padlock uh, icon in the top left. Now, the browser connects to the server using Secure Sockets layer. The server responds with a server certificate, which contains the public key of the web server. Now, the browser then verifies the certificate by checking the sig signature of the CA. Now, to do this, it actually needs a copy of the certificate in its um, store. It's called the browser's trusted store. Now, the browser uses the public key, and the public key is not actually used to encrypt the message. It's actually used to agree a session key with the server, because symmetrical keys, although they're not as secure, they're actually faster than using uh, asymmetrical keys. So the browser and the server basically agree a session key, which is a symmetrical key. The web browser and server encrypt data over the connection using this session key. And when the session ends and the browser reconnects and the entire process is repeated again. Now, there's a video on YouTube and there's the link there that covers that in more detail if you want to go and have a look at it. The various types of digital certificates and if you're trying to purchase a certificate for a website or for use with encrypted MQTT, you will include the two main types. The one is called Domain Validated Certificates, DVC, and the other is called an Extended Validation Certificate, uh, an EVC. Now, the difference between the two types is the degree of trust in the certificate. And the level of encryption they provide is actually identical. So the difference is actually the degree of trust. Now, a Domain Validated Certificate is a X509 certificate typically used for TLS where the identity of the applicant has been validated by proving some control of a DNS domain and it's usually automatic. Now a domain validated certificate isn't as trusted as an extended validation, validation certificate because it has no manual validation. Now an extended validation certificate is, is a certificate used again for HTTPS websites and software that proves the legal entity controlling the websites. Not, not, nothing to do with the domain name. It's the actual legal entity controlling the website or software package. Now, to get an EV certificate requires a verification of the requesting entity's identity by a certificate authority. They're generally more expensive than domain validated certificates because they involve manual validation. They're not automatic. The actual level of encryption provided by both certificates is identical. Now, certificate usage restrictions, generally a certificate is valid for use on a single fully qualified domain name. 
That's, that means a certificate purchase for use on www.mydomain.com can't be used for mail.mydomain.com or any other variant of that. If you need to secure multiple subdomains as well as the main domain, then you can purchase what's called a wildcard certificate. Now, a wildcard certificate covers all subdomains under a particular domain name. So, for example, you could have a certificate for star.mydomain.com, which can be used on mail.mydomain.com and www.mydomain.com and ftp.mydomain.com, etc. It can't be used to secure both mydomain.com and myotherdomain.com because they're totally different domain names. Now, to cover different domain names in a single certificate, you have to purchase what's called a subject alternative name certificate or a SAN certificate. And they generally allow you to secure up to four additional domain names in addition to the main domain name. So you could use one of those to cover www.mydomain.com, mydomain.org, mydomain.net, etc. And you can also change the name covered uh, but you have to have the certificate reissued. Now, why use commercial certificates? It's actually very easy to create your own certificates and encryption keys using free software. They're actually just as secure as the commercial ones. Uh, however, commercial ones are necessary if you need widespread support for your certificate, and that's because the major commercial certificates certificates are actually, or CAs, uh, are built into most web browsers and operating systems. Uh, like we mentioned before, they're actually part of the browser's trusted store. Now, if you didn't use a commercial certificate and you use your own self-generated certificate on, a, on, say, a public website, then when you connect it to that website or a visitor connected to that website, you'd see a message similar to the one below, basically warning him that the site isn't secure. It doesn't mean it hasn't got a, a public key, it just means that the browser doesn't trust the public key. So what you'd need to do, or the visitor need to do, is click on the advanced button there and actually add the an exception so the actual browser trusts it and it would work perfectly well. But the problem is most users wouldn't do that, they would just click the go back button and so they'd leave the site. Now on an internal network, on a private network, then you can easily instruct your users to ignore that message and to, and to add the override. And when you're actually using it with MQTT, then you just install the certificate on your uh, clients and servers. Okay, the, there is a written version of this tutorial on the website, and here's the link here. And you'll also find some links to other related articles on the on the website there. So that brings us to the end of the video. If you've got a comment on the video, then leave it below. If you liked it, then click on the like button below. If you want to know when I publish more videos, then you can always subscribe to the channel. And if you go over to the website, I do publish the occasional newsletter, which you can also subscribe to. So until next time, bye.